All right, so we're gonna change gears a little bit and we are gonna go to the roadmap. As always, our favorite Tim Hall is gonna be reviewing a ton of material. So if you're like me, when you're going through this, your head's gonna spin a little bit. You're gonna realize that the engineering team is super busy cranking out a lot of really amazing features. And um, I know the last time I listened to Tim's talk, I think I had to listen to the recording like four or five times before I could really capture everything. So it's really dense, but the good news is we get to look at this a couple more times so we can really grok how much spectacular work the team is working on. So with that, Tim, would you like to take it away? All right, Chris, thanks. Let's get into it. Um, so let's go through uh, today what we're going to talk about. Um, I want to do a little bit of a recap. Where are we now? Um, lots of work been done, certainly since the last Influx Days talk, the one we gave for the European audience in May. Um, but we also have a lot of new folks coming. And um, some of the feedback we get in the community Slack channels and, and the community forums is, um, hey, sometimes it feels like we're trying to catch the speeding boat of, of InfluxDB. And uh, can you just make sure you catch me up? I have a day job. I don't read all your blog posts and every press release. So uh, we'll try to do that first. And then we're going to talk about um, the VS Code plugin and the work that we've done in the browser to support developers where, where you are. Um, and go. we'll show some examples. We'll walk through a little bit of uh, the specific functionality we've enabled and how that plays out in terms of uh, what, what you're building and how we can support you in that. And then lastly, uh, optimize time for awesome. What are we building in the platform uh, to allow you to write less code and capitalize on features and capabilities uh, to help power your solution? So that's what we'll go through. So let's start with uh, where are we now? Um, we have spent uh, the last two years uh, focused on building our multi-tenant cloud offering um, all of our latest innovations will land there first. So when Paul is talking about the new capabilities of IOX and particularly extreme cardinality use cases, um, it's gonna land there first. Um, that is going to be our proving ground, our validation environment, uh, and uh, we have the ability to test and ensure that these things are gonna work at scale before we uh, move out into the wild. Um, it's a serverless offering. Obviously it's managed by us, it's a cloud product. Um, and it has a built-in UI uh, to support uh, builders and operators. So helping you build resources and artifacts that run on top of the platform, as well as telling you how they're functioning and working, uh, providing you billing information, usage information, and more. And we've worked hard to ensure that it is where you want it, meaning we've deployed it across all three major cloud service providers, um, and we've integrated it within the marketplaces for those providers as well. So if you, if you or your company has uh, made a commitment uh, to burn down uh, some amount of revenue uh, for uh, AWS, Azure, GCP, some spend commitment, um, you can uh, consume InfluxDB Cloud uh, through their marketplaces and take advantage of that. Um, and there's multiple ways that you can access cloud. Um, you don't have to pay for it. There's a free tier that's available. If you've got a hobby project or you wanna just explore the capabilities of the platform, um, you can sign up for free. Um, and then obviously uh, there's usage-based pricing and you can work with our sales if you want to make an annual commitment. But we are big believers in open source. And uh, for many of you, you may have started your journey with us using the open source software. So this is software, it's self-managed, um, typically supported by uh, many of us through our community efforts and our um, developer advocates and evangelists. Um, but it's a single node. Um, it, it is great for deployment at the edge. And uh, there were a bunch of questions about processing at the edge in Paul's talk, and, and we'll pick up on that in a minute. Um, and so if you need a store and query at an, an edge location or a small compute footprint, open source could be a, a great starting point for you. But also um, occasionally developers like to have the, uh, the query engine and all the capabilities local on their laptop. Um, and so uh, throwing open source on your laptop, is per particularly these days if you're uh, working uh, a little bit more mobile or occasionally connected and you want to have uh, an environment uh, that's um, solely standalone, um, you can certainly do that with the, uh, with the open source offering. Um, and the UI is embedded these days to support uh, your build activities and get you started. And then uh, uh, last but certainly not least, um, we have folks that are building uh, against the cloud environment, um, building using open source, potentially at the edge or just a development environment. And then we have folks that want to uh, scale and deploy these things, uh, again, potentially in networks that are not connected to the public internet, 
um, and they need a scale out option. And so our enterprise software, again, software offering self-managed um, is our commercial offering. You can purchase and license it. It has the core capabilities that are available in cloud and open source core capability, but it also allows for a multi-node scale out to ensure high availability. And it has some advanced security features that many enterprises need, want, and desire uh, to link in with their uh, corporate security infrastructure. And what we've done is for those core capabilities is we've layered across um, the top, a common API for reads and writes. So in FluxDB, uh, no matter how you approach it, or no matter where you started your build from, you should be able to leverage that common read and write API uh, to deploy your solutions on top wherever you need. Now, um, for those of you that actually started with us uh, in the open source environment and maybe on our 1.x version, uh, we have been continuing to advance uh, the limo ride uh, migration or upgrade options to go from 1.x to 2.x. And so there is an automated command uh, when you get the, the latest open source bits, you can just run InfluxD upgrade and it will automatically uh, walk through a series of steps to get you up and running on the latest and greatest version. But uh, we got feedback uh, from many of you that, hey, I don't like automation. <laughs> I don't trust it. I want to be in more control over the steps uh, that are going on. And so we've documented all of the things that that automation is actually doing, and including what happens to the configuration, um, something called a DBRP mapping, which allows you to use now both Flux and Influx QL um, with the new version, um, how the authorizations uh, are being um, generated and used. Um, as well as uh, making a copy of the data uh, and organizing it in, in the new fashion um, that the latest edition expects and uh, specific instructions on what to do with continuous query. So all that's documented and, and made available. So if you don't want to use the automation and you want to take those step-by-step -step approach, um, you definitely can do that. And then uh, last but certainly not least, again, um, we got so many people out there that are deploying uh, InfluxDB OSS using Docker. Um, and so uh, the Docker-based uh, uh, automated and manual install instructions and uh, upgrade options are available uh, for you to follow. Um, you can do things like uh, hook in some customized scripts into the Docker uh, setup uh, to get things going. If you're in a CI CD sort of environment where you're spinning these things up all the time and you want to bootstrap, uh, pieces of, of uh, either resources or users or uh, other types of things with um, with your open source instance, um, that is all possible to do uh, now with the Docker environment. So all of those pieces are available for you to, to uh, take advantage of. And we know many of you have, uh, so we obviously there's a phone home capability inside of the open source and it tells us how many of you are uh, being successful with that. So we see um, really good uh, adoption. Um, but as you go through this, and for those of you that haven't caught up with where we are with InfluxDB open source, um, there are a bunch of new things uh, in the latest edition. So we made sure authentication is on by default. This was one of the feedback items of the, um, of the original uh, open source edition is, hey, um, there's a bunch of people who've sort of put this on the public internet and there's no authentication. Um, that's uh, not a great situation to be in. We don't want anybody to have their data hijacked, obviously. Um, and so now we are requiring that authentication by default. So um, that's really a, a first step. Um, we also, uh, um, in the in the in either the manual steps or the, the automated steps, uh, we are not uh, automatically migrating your administrative users over. Um, and so it's a time to sort of reassess, um, you know, who has admin access and, and why, um, and uh, set those up in uh, the latest edition. For those of you that are using either Chronograph from, from, uh, from us for your dashboarding solution or Grafana, those dashboards will continue to work successfully using the compatibility APIs that we have in place. As a matter of fact, both those tools will work with our cloud product as well. Um, use those compatibility APIs. Um, if you're shifting from an on-prem environment to, to the cloud, just point those APIs, create a new data source, point it at the cloud, and uh, it will continue to work. Um, our continuous query functionality um, has been replaced with the task functionality uh, and or, um, uh, yeah, and the, basically the task subsystem that exists. Um, and there's specific uh, information and instructions about how to, uh, uh, structure those those uh, flux tasks. 
based on what you've got already from a CQ perspective. And there's a number of examples that you can follow. And it's relatively straightforward. It's all built in and um, uh, give you finer, finer grained uh, access and control over what's actually happening with those queries. Um, uh, InfluxDB open source 1.x did support a wide variety of protocols. And I, I, there was a question about uh, systemd and collectd and some other things. Um, all of those are now supported through Telegraph. So use Telegraph as the mechanism to convert from uh, those uh, existing protocols and then send the data uh, directly to InfluxDB using the line protocol format. Uh, from a platform support pr perspective, we continue to advance um, and we have builds available for Docker, Windows, and Windows is officially supported from an open source perspective, um, as well as ARM. And if you can see over my shoulder over here, I've got uh, Raspberry Pi running ARM64 and monitoring that uh, successfully using uh, the open source edition. Um, and then last but not least, um, one, one significant change is the subscription API. There is not a subscription API on the latest edition of uh, open source. Um, and so if you are using capacitor for stream processing tasks, um, you will dual write the data to capacitor. That's the best practice. And um, those tasks will continue to function. So you write the data to capacitor, write it to InfluxDB and continue to use those stream processing tasks. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about capacitor here in a second. Specifically, um, we've continued to advance uh, Capacitor, and what we've done is we really want to ensure that our, our users, our developers who um, have taken advantage of Capacitor, some of which um, have significant investment and, and Capacitor's features and capabilities, can continue to use that going forward. And again, it does work with our latest editions of InfluxDB, whether it's cloud, enterprise, or open source. What we've done is we've added uh, a new engine inside of Capacitor. So side by side with the TickScript engine, there is now a Flux task engine, and it does support the V2 API for tasks for the creation um, and execution of those tasks. So again, it has provides some sort of a forward compatibility mechanism. And if you're uh, creating automation uh, to use those uh, V2 APIs, again, they'll work against the latest editions of cloud and open source. Uh, and for enterprise, you would you would point this at Capacitor as the engine for, for running your Flux-based tasks. In addition, we've extended the tick script capability um, to allow you to um, use Flux as a query um, option. So if you want to use InfluxQL or Flux, now there's a query Flux node that exists that you can take advantage of. And we're continuing also to advance the alert handler additions. Um, in this case, we've added support for Xenos. I think that was a community request that came out. And then one of the other things we're doing in parallel that you'll see in, in a little bit is as we continue to do these integrations with third-party systems, whether it's MQTT or Xenos or uh, ServiceNow, we're also advancing Flux. So that's available across um, both of these ecosystems. And the idea, again, is uh, if you'd like to start using Flux as the means for uh, building your, your batch processing uh, capabilities, you can do so. Um, uh, and if you're like... If you struggled with TickScript or you're looking to make a change, uh, perhaps moving from TickScript to Flux also provides you with that uh, future proofing and forward compatibility. And then last but not least, um, we did open source a feature that was only available with Capacitor Enterprise. It was a security integration that allows Capacitor, when paired with InfluxDB, to delegate its um, authentication mechanism across. And so it uh, reduces the amount of configuration uh, that you need to put in place. Uh, but for those folks that are using Capacitor, uh, with InfluxDB Enterprise uh, that is now available in the open source edition. Um, now, another thing that uh, that's come up is, hey, yeah, I've got this tick script, uh, but I really want to take advantage of Flux. And so is there a way for me to convert these things easily? Um, and so we had one of our uh, community contributors, uh, Benito, uh, work on a tick script uh, package, compatibility package for uh, Flux-based tasks. And what this does is it creates a set of constructs that look and will feel very familiar to anybody who's worked in TickScript. And um, yeah, it'll make that conversion super easy. So definitely check out this package, um, check out the associated documentation that's there. Um, and this should really ease uh, that conversion process if you're going through that. So um, in terms of sort of resetting where we are and where we're going, um, we are really focused today on teams of developers and builders. I think Evan mentioned this, uh, sort of helping builders make an impact. Um, and 
we've done a lot of thoughtful uh, user research and review on how best uh, we can support folks. As we've embedded a user interface, both into our cloud product and the open source, as we've looked at how people are interacting and building, um, we've learned a few things. Um, the first is that developers rarely work alone, which is sometimes surprising. Paul works alone a lot, but uh, uh, many of you are collaborating with others and have questions. I don't know how many times you may have looked at a dashboard or a query that's been written by one of your colleagues and said, well, I have some questions about this. How did they arrive at this solution? Um, is this even the correct query that we're trying to run uh, from an analysis perspective? Um, and so that starts the process of collaboration. How do you learn about how they arrived at that particular destination? We're going to talk about destinations a little bit here in a second as well. And so some of the things that we've learned is that we need to do a better job of meeting developers where they are. Um, if you approach our cloud product uh, as a starting point, um, you are going to be exposed to everything that we offer from a capability perspective, from an operational perspective through the browser. That's your first point of entry. And yet that may not be your ultimate destination. If you're building an application that's going to leverage time series data and provide a solution, um, you're probably going to end up in an IDE doing most of your work there. And so how can we support the process of you exploring the platform, understanding its capabilities, and then not losing those learnings when you shift to VS Code or another um, integrated development environment? Second is um, we need to make sure we're supporting languages you love to work with. Um, and we'll get into how we're doing that and, and some more of the specifics. Um, but the idea is, yes, we have a common API that exists across um, all the uh, editions of the platform that we offer. Um, but uh, if I'm working within you know, Go or C Sharp or Java, I'd like to be able to make those API calls without wrapping them all myself. Obviously, exposing this as a software solution, either through enterprise or open source, or a cloud-based service that you can consume, um, that's, that's, those options are available to you. And obviously our, our um, ability to offer this direct to you through um, the website, our website, or uh, our cloud provider marketplace integrations um, will make that uh, buying choice and decision as easy as possible. Um, and then lastly, like where are you going, right? Supporting a variety of destinations. So today, if you're building a custom application that has its own visualization, that's one kind of destination. If we are the destination, you want to use our uh, inbuilt um, uh, dashboarding capabilities, that's a destination. Um, if you want to use Chronograph, or for many of you uh, have been using, we're up to, I think, almost 70,000 daily active users of Chronograph, um, and you want to continue to use that as your dashboarding solution, um, that's a destination. If you want to use Grafana or something else that exists in the open source community because you're connecting it to a wide variety of other data sources and you've already crossed the learning threshold, of how to use those capabilities, that's a destination. So how do we support you in any of those sort of ending points and more that maybe we haven't thought of? Um, that's meeting you where you are. And so we're really thinking deeply and thoughtfully about that construction process, the assembly process, and running and operating this. And so we'll, we'll talk about a particular workflow and, and show you where we are. And then uh, last but not least, um, we want to optimize the time to awesome. And so what this means is um, as we build more capabilities into the platform, um, we wanna make sure we're supporting that team, uh, the teams of builders and developers. We wanna support their collaboration through the process as you build the resources that run on top of the, uh, of the platform itself. We're building things into the platform. Um, Paul mentioned a few things and we'll go into some, some detail on those items uh, to allow you to avoid writing code, frankly. Uh, as we looked at how people are building time series applications, what things really fundamentally need to be in the platform and how can we expose that as a capability that you can just tap into as opposed to having to write, uh, you know, rafts and rafts of code to solve that same kind of problem. We also want to ease the uh, observability um, and the operational uh, aspects of what's going on with the platform itself. So how can you understand how many queries are executing or what are the performance of those queries or task failures and when they occur and why that's potentially happening? Um, could be from missing data, could be from a wide variety of things. How can we build that um, more easily into the platform and expose it to you in a way that's easy to consume? And then uh, on this idea of collection, right? So uh, Paul mentioned the data collection. We want to ease both data collection and movement of data at scale. Um, this is super important. Um, and uh, we'll get into the specifics here about what we have and where we're going. So with that as the context, 
Uh, let's now talk about meeting meeting developers where where they are. So um, two kinds of ideas, uh, browser-based tooling and IDEs. Obviously, we have a, a command line interface and API that's available as well, but th these are the two primary pieces of, uh, of tooling that we've uh, been talking about with developers as we've been doing our user research. Again, if you arrive in our uh, cloud environment, you're going to start using the browser for sure. It's the first point of contact. Um, it's the first thing you're going to experience. And so we've recently introduced um, a new developer workbench that allows you to create resources and artifacts. I'm going to talk about that in some detail, and you see some screenshots of it here on the left. But we've also been uh, advancing um, the features and capabilities with our Flux extension to VS Code. So many of you are out there telling us, hey, I'm using VS Code. Uh, what's, you know, can you make this easier for me to create, run, and execute my Flux queries? Uh, can you give me syntax highlighting and auto corrections? And um, can you give me other error highlighting capabilities um, and make it easy to connect with uh, multiple instances of InfluxDB? I'm running open source at times, but then I'm also deploying in cloud. I need to support multiple connections and switch easily between them. And so um, to start, let's talk about the browser side of this. So the first thing uh, about developers not working alone is that we need a mechanism through the browser that allows people to collaborate. And so one of the things that we heard is, hey, I need an easy sort of templated way to be able to create a variety of different resources on the platform, whether it's a task, whether it's a query that ends up as a dashboard cell. But one of the things I'm really missing is I don't have the ability through the browser to create a scratch pad for code, code snippets or other examples that I wanna share with um, developers or uh, the rest of my teammates. And in fact, um, uh, I work with Scott Anderson on the documentation team quite regularly, uh, building and exploring the platform and, and building queries. And he and I frequently are collaborating on a wide variety of queries and query structures. It doesn't necessarily mean that query is fully executable, but I may have a question. I may be working through the process of analysis and I may stop at a particular point. And um, you know, if I'm in a different time zone than Scott or I'm traveling, uh, I would like to ask him a question and allow us to, to work on this asynchronously. And I can do that through creating a notebook where I can put that information, that scratch pad for code and snippets, um, and, and ask him to take a look at it. And he can comment in, he can come in and help me edit the query, um, and then we can decide ultimately where that's going to end up. Does it end up as a task? Does it end up as a, a dashboard cell or something else? Meaning that the notebook is this environment in which I can construct all of this uh, flux code, I can visualize it, I can see it in its raw data format, there's panels available for me to configure and tune this into exactly what I need and what I want, um, ultimately then producing some sort of output. But providing that scratch pad within the browser is critical, um, it doesn't exist anywhere else. That's very different for, than folks that um, you know, may be working in an IDE uh, and they can just have those files lying around their, uh, their laptop. So um, one of the things that we've uh, done is we've extended uh, the capabilities um, of the notebooks environment, um, again, to support new users through their journey. So there's a, a mechanism uh, for um, exploring the schema, for pointing and clicking at the various uh, measurements tags and fields as a starting point for building your first Flux query, um, and then uh, a browsing panel uh, for the various functions that you might want to apply to that data once you've selected it. Um, but if you've made that investment and you're like, hey, uh, I see what's going on here, this is great, but I ultimately want to take a query that I've constructed out to my IDE, um, you can now do that through an export, and you can choose the specific uh, language that you want to work with. So um, specifically, this option to take a Flux script and export it to a client library will now pop up um, all those series of um, client library languages that Paul showed, whether it's Arduino or C Sharp, uh, Node.js, PHP, Ruby, et cetera, you see here on the right. Um, and uh, it will export that query with the appropriate wrapper code um, that you can just drop in your IDE and, and run with. So any investment that you've made in the browser is not abandoned. You can essentially take that, you can um, and take that and, and run. And so then when you get to the IDE environment, um, in particular with VS Code, we've built this extension. So the Flux extension is easy to install, single click. Um, 
and has uh, a super set of uh, powerful capabilities from that auto completion and highlighting to now code execution. Um, and so today we've, uh, we've added to it a resource browser, uh, which includes the various connections that you can make to multiple InfluxDB instances or accounts. And then by switching between those, you can see what resources are available, including you can do the schema browsing. So you see here a bucket and you see a list of buckets that I'm uh, working with and tasks. Um, and today, and we'll get to this in a minute, uh, for API invocable scripts, um, that's a new resource type that you'd be able to see, construct, and create um, using the VS Code Editor. And of course, um, as you're building your Flux script and you're getting those auto completion uh, suggestions or you're looking at the error checking, you can all now execute the Flux uh, uh, script directly from the IDE and get a uh, table of results that you see here on the side. So again, really leverage the capabilities of that IDE to build and construct your application as quickly as possible. So let's go through like a typical flow, a development flow. So if you're using Influx uh, DB open source, we have the same uh, UI embedded um, and the latest uh, version uh, 2.1 will include support for notebooks. Um, so you'd be able to start in the browser and uh, and we, we have this nice getting started experience about getting your data in and maybe building your first query or setting up an alert task. Um, but if you choose um, after that exploration to uh, go out to VS Code, obviously you can do that export process that I mentioned and still interact uh, directly with the, the open source environment. Now we've got a number of uh, folks that are building applications that, again, may deploy against an open source instance at the edge. They may deploy against the cloud environment for scale, or that they may want to deploy in a, in a private environment using InfluxDB Enterprise. And so um, taking advantage of the APIs that we've exposed, one of the next questions is, well, I'm going to take all of the resources and artifacts that I've built um, those that need to deploy on InfluxDB uh, and those that uh, may be packaged up on my application. And of course, I'm going to use something like GitHub um, as my source control environment. And obviously, the connection there from Vis Visual Studio is, is um, pretty clear. Like that integration is already available and everybody's taking advantage of that. But what you can do is you can use um, GitHub Actions or our templating mechanism to take those assets and resources and deploy them into the cloud environment. And if you haven't um, seen the doc documentation or uh, blog posts around this, um, you can actually search for uh, you know, GitHub Actions uh, InfluxDB. There's some information out there and available for you. I, I think there were a couple of questions in Paul's talk about that, um, but those APIs are exposed and available. And of course, um, for those then that want to deploy on enterprise, you could use the same mechanisms uh, to take those assets and artifacts and, and package them up to work against uh, InfluxDB Enterprise um, by building them uh, off the source code control from GitHub. But when I look at the workflow together, right, and I see all of the different steps that you might go through, it then sort of paints the picture for us about how we streamline this. And I think this is what Paul was touching on a little bit, is how do we make this process sort of easier and better uh, across all of these different constituents, whether you're using the browser, whether you're using VS Code, whether you're using cloud, enterprise, or open source. And so the roadmap for me paints out this way. Uh, for our browser-based tooling, um, the ability for you to create uh, a stack and, and that template creation that will fuel the, um, the mechanisms that we have for um, either GitHub Actions or the repeated deployment of these things isn't currently expo exposed in the browser. It's available through CLI and API calls. And so bringing that as an experience into the browser would be a good step for those that wanna primarily use the browser as their um, creation and construction tool. But what that also means is the browser uh, probably needs a mechanism for you to integrate with source code control. Um, so be able to select which uh, source code control environment that you would like your resources to expose into. Again, today you can do this, but you're going to step out, you're going to step away from the browser, and you're going to use the CLI tooling to make this happen. Bringing it into the browser keeps you in the environment that you're comfortable working in, and so enabling that step uh, would, be, uh, would be ideal. Now, if we do those first two things, then if you have multiple organizations, which again is a, is a construct that exists within cloud and the open source environments, moving the various resources between a dev organization and a production organization, as an example, um, would be a, a very straightforward process. Um, and so uh, we'll look to, to see how we can integrate that in the browser. And, and then there's support for more destinations. So as I mentioned, um, 
Today we can do the export from a notebook to a task or a dashboard cell or even to those um, different client libraries, but there's no reason why we couldn't um, extend that to allow you to build a Grafana dashboard, for example, um, or a dashboard cell that you could export and import. Um, so as we get feedback from, from you all from the community side, uh, we'd love to understand what destinations um, you'd like us to enable. Um, and so that's a, a clear point where we can extend that tooling to, uh, to support the generation of those artifacts from the browser. Um, and then in the IDE, um, we want to expand the resource browsing capabilities and creation capabilities from the IDE. And we'll talk about API invocable scripts here in a minute as the next one that's being enabled. Um, but it's really about just continuing to ensure that um, keeping you in, the, in that IDE environment that you know and love and supporting exactly what you're trying to construct um, is our focus in developer ergonomics. On the InfluxDB enterprise side, um, for those that are building applications that they may need to deploy, uh, we heard some feedback that um, they'd love to have the buckets and the delete API. So one of the things that, that has changed recently is with Influx, there is no uh, delete uh, meta query. This was a meta query that was available through Influx QL. And so those that are embracing Flux are saying, hey, how do I, how do I delete data if I want to drop some or remove some? How do I go about doing that? Well, there is a specific API to allow you to do that um, as opposed to a meta query. And this provides for stronger control and, and uh, ability to execute these things more reliably. Um, and so adding that uh, as a mechanism onto InfluxDB Enterprise to ease the compatibility and deployment of these things is, is ideal. Um, and so look for that to arrive in our uh, 1.10 release of InfluxDB Enterprise. Uh, we're targeting that for Q1. Um, but that's, uh, that's something that we're working through and we, we love the feedback and uh, it's definitely something that we'll, uh, we'll look to deliver. And then last but not least, in terms of meeting you where you are, like um, we're expanding our regional availability. Uh, we can now, we're now deployed across, I think, uh, nine different locations across three different cloud service providers. And as we get folks who uh, need and want expanded uh, availability, let us know. Like this is a great signal for us that you're diving in and that you need uh, InfluxDB somewhere else, uh, we, can certainly, we can certainly do that for you. All right, so let's shift gears to, uh, to optimizing time for awesome and what we're building into the platform at its core. To, this should help you reduce uh, code writing and more. Now, one of the things that's, uh, that's available now, uh, and again, if you haven't been uh, keeping up with the blog posts and whatnot, is explicit schema support. Uh, this is available only in cloud, uh, but it is feedback that we've gotten uh, over the years. So one of the most powerful capabilities of InfluxDB is schema on write. So if you're in an IoT environment um, and you've got firmware updates that are changing the shape of the data that's uh, maybe coming off of those, uh, those devices, um, having the, the schema to be super flexible is, uh, is a powerful um, capability of the platform. However, there are other environments or if you're building an application where you want to lock down uh, what's happening on the back end, um, schema on write then is, is sort of undesirable. And so what we've done is we've extended uh, this capability in cloud. So when you define a bucket, you can define an explicit schema uh, using one of the following mechanisms, which includes JSON, CSV, or a new line delimited JSON format. And essentially uh, it will block non-compliant writes. Um, now you can extend that schema over time by adding new uh, um, fields and tags, uh, but uh, there's no removal of those things. Um, so it's only additive uh, as, you, as you go. So the key here is if you need that level of control, if you need to lock down that schema, if you want to prevent um, sort of uh, those additions from happening on write, uh, you now have the, the mechanism to do that. And that's available as a, as a cloud only feature. Um, next is uh, today we're announcing uh, the availability of something called API invocable scripts. Um, the idea here is that uh, if you want to store a flux script that is parameterized uh, and then invoke it from your code, you can do this. Um, the idea here being that um, the current mechanism is sending the entire Flux script uh, from source code to uh, either the cloud or open source or enterprise environment where it's going to execute. Uh, and the idea was, well, 
uh, maybe I'd like to have the query specified on the server side and just invoke it through API and just provide it with the specific parameters that need to fill in. So that is now available uh, in cloud as a starting point. Uh, and so there's a new API set, the scripts API um, that's available, and we're enabling the VS Code uh, Flux extension to allow you to create those scripts. So in the same way that you saw the uh, tasks appear in the browser uh, window, you'll now see scripts there and you can create a new script and construct it uh, similar to what you see here, which is you can um, parameterize of the various elements and then provide those parameters when you do the invocation. And so here's an example of using curl to do the, the invocation. Uh, and of course, there's some replacement examples here. You use your specific uh, URL, but you'll get a script ID to call and you use your token to invoke it, but then you just send it the, a pack of um, JSON delimited uh, key value pairs, which are the parameters that then will replace in the script itself. Now, of course, we'll um, continue to work to expand this to support uh, the CLI, uh, the CRUD based operations for you know, creating and, and listing these things so you know that they exist. Um, and then we'll also allow for uh, the construction of these API invocable scripts as a resource within that notebook uh, experience. So a specific resource type that you can uh, create uh, from the browser itself. But this is available today for all of you builders who wanna start uh, taking advantage of this uh, through the VS Code plugin or through the API directly. Now, in terms of Flux, we've continued to advance its features and capabilities. Uh, you see here a list of all of the notification targets uh, that we support. So if you would like to uh, send uh, information from InfluxDB based on anomaly detection or other kinds of queries or other analysis that you're running, you can send them out to you know, pretty much uh, the most commonly used things, whether it's a, um, an SMTP service like SendGrid or SES, um, or whether it's um, more modern systems like um, Zen Austin ServiceNow, or our, all of our old favorites like PagerDuty and Slack. Um, the latest uh, in advancements are ServiceNow, WebEx Teams, and Alerta. Um, and this should provide us with almost a complete overlap for every um, alert target that was uh, available in Capacitor as well. And we'll continue to advance uh, both of these forward. I also noticed there was a question uh, in Paul's talk about um, SQL. And if you're not aware, uh, Flux actually does support today the ability for you to query uh, relational data, bring it into context, and then join it with your time series data. So there's a series of Flux from functions um, that exists. You can do SQL.from uh, and uh, assign the um, connection string and parameters to that uh, database where it exists, uh, along with a SQL query, bring that data back into context. We actually use this internally. Um, obviously, we have got a bunch of information about users and, and so on and so forth. And working with the user ID, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but I can't remember every user ID in the system. Uh, and so combining that with the actual name of a customer um, so that I can we can make sure we give you know the best support possible uh, by knowing that name and not just uh, working with numbers um, is key. Um, that also allows me to write less code, frankly. Uh, previously, if I was going to combine a relational source with a uh, with a time series source like InfluxDB, um, I'm going to have to write code to basically issue those two queries and then um, integrate them in code. Uh, and today you can do it just through Flux Script, which is pretty powerful. Um, so definitely check that out if you were not aware of that. Um, but what we're also announcing today is uh, Flux now has uh, time zone support. So if you have specific use cases where you need time zone support, uh, in particular, uh, you know, this funky thing that we do in the U.S. between daylight savings and, uh, and uh, standard time, um, you can now import uh, this time zone package and specify uh, your time zone location, uh, and it will, the platform will automatically deal with those, those capabilities. And then last but not least, uh, we have a relentless uh, focus on performance, sort of advancing uh, Flux uh, performance, making it as fast as possible. Um, so we started with uh, pushing down certain query capabilities uh, to the storage tier. Um, we've been working on a variety of function optimizations, including pivot and derivative and more. Um, we've recently compiled the standard library of functions, which makes it go faster. And we've been looking at other things like um, the result sets coming from a CSV format, uh, making sure that's as fast as possible. And where we're going next is um, digging into uh, query vectorization and more. So if you're a, 
uh, if you're a database junkie and you know what vectorization is about, um, about finding that uh, that data as quickly as possible. Um, those are some investigations that are going on now, but we're continuing to advance um, the Flux performance profile and it just making it faster and faster uh, with every release. And if you look at the release notes um, that exist for, for Flux in our documentation, you'll see that there's a pretty regular cadence of, of releases that are going on that extend from functions uh, to performance and, and more. So as I look forward into 2022, um, uh, these four kinds of uh, optimizations uh, seem sort of self-evident. One is continuing to focus on the teams and the collaboration work. Um, second is advancing our platform in innovation, uh, digging into tenant uh, observability and operations, and then lastly, easing uh, data collection and movement. And so just to touch on these a little bit, um, Right now we're working on um, within InfluxDB Cloud, the ability for you to use a single email to access multiple accounts. Now, why is this important? Uh, we have people that set up personal accounts and then want to join their team account and they'd like to keep those two things separate. And so that's the first step in the process. Next, we're going to enable within the browser, the ability for you to create multiple organizations within the same account. This could be, a uh, uh, beneficial for those that are building applications where you want to physically separate those those tenants so that they don't have um, so that you can uh, isolate their usage into uh, different groups um, and so uh, offering that through through the browser will be a, a big step forward um, and then last but not least uh, we will extend uh, for finer grained uh, role-based permissions um, to allow you to access a particular dashboard or a particular resource within the platform. Um, so that's been a, a definitely a request. Today we're supporting what's called high trust teams where everybody who joins sort of has the same level of permissions. But as we go forward to enable that us to be a destination uh, for you and a destination that you can uh, partition to appropriate access for the right users, those finer grain resource permissions are required. Um, another platform uh, related thing that we're going to work on for cloud is triggers. And so we've gotten uh, a lot of feedback about uh, IoT use cases, in particular, how to deal with late arriving data. So if I have uh, query processing or batch tasks that are going on that, that are working against the data that I have, how do I get notified when uh, data arrives outside a particular time window? And then how can I either reprocess, re-aggregate or re-alert uh, based on the arrival of that data? So the notion of triggers uh, will allow you to set up a mechanism by which you can look back um, at a certain time distance and be notified uh, when data arrives outside that time window and then take an appropriate action. So look for that uh, in 2022. And there we go. And then as Paul mentioned, um, we're gonna work towards uh, this notion of extreme uh, cardinality use cases. So for many of you, uh, you may be using us uh, to store both metrics and logs, but perhaps your log uh, retention policy is relatively short because you're, uh, you're not wanting to store that uh, log information for very long. Um, one of the things that Paul mentioned is as we open up, the platform for more extreme cardinality, um, we become a, an option for log ar archival as a result. Um, but I think one of the big things that people look at in terms of metrics and uh, are use cases around things like distributed tracing or call records or tr network trace routes, all of those things will lead you towards an extreme cardinality use case. And so um, this will land first in cloud, um, that is our intention. And we're working through that uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, and then we'll determine what the mechanisms are uh, to uh, deliver that more broadly. But um, cloud is the first proven ground for this capability. And yes, it will support both Influx QL and Flux as the primary query languages. And once we uh, sort of get this all working in a manner that we feel confident, then we'll move on to um, the SQL support that Paul mentioned. So I wouldn't expect that uh, earlier than Q4 of next year, um, but um, you know, like Paul said, it's uh, lies, damn lies, and schedules, I think. So we'll, we'll work through this as quickly as possible. And for those that are interested in participating in a, in a SQL beta, definitely reach out to us either through Slack, community, or, or email. And uh, we'd love to um, understand who wants to participate in something like that um, so that we can uh, work with you when we're ready. In terms of um, observability, Within uh, cloud, we have created an operator template um, that exists that you can deploy. 
um, to show you various uh, usage and operations, whether it's your um, the reads and writes, the cardinality, uh, and now we're extending that to show write errors by storing that information. Um, and we'll continue to extend that kind of template behavior um, as more information is available that can be exposed. So um, if you are a cloud user and you haven't in installed the operator template, um, definitely check it out. Easy to pull in and uh, easy to work with. And if there are specific things that you're looking for, definitely hit us up and we can uh, look to extend the template in the direction you want to go. For our enterprise customers, we have been really focused very deeply on extending the observability uh, uh, and metrics to support operations of enterprise at scale. So many of our enterprise customers are running InfluxDB Enterprise for multiple development teams. And so um, the, the level of metrics that have been provided previously have been sort of at the database level or a little bit shallow, I would say. And so the request has always been, hey, can I get down to per measurement metrics or can I get down to understanding who is actually creating series um, and with what frequency? And maybe most importantly, um, I can't remember when my license is going to expire. <laughs> can you just show me that as a metric so that I can set up my own sorts of alerts? So if you haven't picked up um, the latest release of InfluxDB Enterprise 195, which is out and available, and yes, the Docker images are up. Um, definitely check that out. All of these uh, uh, metrics are now exposed and available for you to take advantage of. Um, and I would say with the latest release of, of Enterprise, um, we've got, uh, got a significant reduction in the memory usage when using the TSI-1 index. Um, so I would definitely take advantage of that. Uh, we've also been focused on improving uh, and enhancing all of the eventual consistency mechanisms, uh, whether it's um, an exponential back off to our hinted handoff capability uh, or um, improving how anti-entropy anti works, uh, out of order rights, uh, a whole series of things uh, continue to help with the overall operation and health of InfluxDB Enterprise when you are managing it yourself. Now, one of the other areas that we're deeply focused on is um, improving the backup and restore capabilities. So a couple of these things landed with the latest release, um, just making it more flexible in terms of how you can uh, restore data. Sometimes if you take a, a backup, for example, and then you want to restore it in a different retention policy or you want to override uh, the retention policy with a different value, you can now uh, do that with the uh, the the restore uh, commands in enterprise as part of uh, the 1.95 release. Um, and this is an area we're not done. Um, so we're planning on continuing to focus on the backup um, uh, and restore improvements uh, for the 1.10 release again, and look for that in uh, Q1 of 2022. And last but not least, um, easing data collection and, and movement, um, three mechanisms agent-based, cloud-native, and the bulk import and replication to cloud. So on the agent-based, uh, this is what you know and love uh, with Telegraph. We just recently released, released in cloud um, the ability for you to create a Telegraph configuration from any of the existing input plugins that exist. So previously, you were limited to five um, the system and Docker and Kubernetes and a few others. Uh, but now you can create that Telegraph configuration literally from any of the plugins that exist. Um, so here's an example of Kafka. Uh, you can also add uh, a configuration of a plugin to an existing uh, configuration that's uh, within InfluxDB. And if you haven't taken advantage of the fact that Telegraph can now pull its configuration from a URL, again, cloud supports the ability for you to do that, but it doesn't require you to use InfluxDB Cloud or open source. You can host the Telegraph configurations on any HTTP server you want and have Telegraph point to it and pull that down. It's another way that you could instrument, develop, and deploy um, these capabilities. Um, and uh, our next release of Telegraph should be out in December. Um, here's a sneak preview of what's already there. Some external plugins that I spelled wrong, oops. Um, but for its Oracle and DB2 are available as external plugins. Um, there's a new output plugin for uh, Azure Event Hubs if you're using that. And we're making some advancements uh, using Starlark. Uh, there's a Starlark process uh, parser, sorry, Starlark processor that already exists. It allows you to aggregate metrics at the edge. Um, but there's an additional aggregator plugin that's going to be arriving. And again, we're going to continue to work on some more performance improvements that we've gotten around uh, line protocol. So that's on the agent base side. Look for that all in December. 
Um, Telegraph tends to be our most uh, um, steady and uh, continuous release of software, expecting quarterly releases of feature bearing capability along with uh, sort of monthly maintenance releases as necessary. Now, Paul mentioned this um, within the cloud environment. Uh, you know, if you're using MQTT and you've got an MQTT broker that's available within cloud, um, uh, you don't necessarily want to have to deploy and use Telegraph to move data from that source to target. And so uh, the idea is we'll be working on an MQTT native cloud configuration that you can set up within your cloud account. Uh, to allow it to uh, tap into an MQTT broker and pull that across. And then as Paul mentioned, uh, once we get that in place, we'll look to expand that to include other cloud-based messaging services, everything from uh, Kafka to PubSub and Kinesis and more. And then just to wrap up um, on the bulk data import side, um, we currently have tooling available for you to support your migration from open source or enterprise. If you're done sort of managing these things yourselves and you want to take advantage of, um, you know, the fully uh, elastic um, and serverless capabilities of cloud today, you can work with our support team to uh, essentially hand your TSM files uh, over to us and we'll bulk import them into your cloud environment. Uh, we're building out CLI tooling to facilitate this process and make it self-service. That's sort of our next step. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, we are making a commitment to activate a durable data replication mechanism for open source and enterprise users uh, to send your data to cloud. You can think of this a little bit like the subscription API that we uh, had previously on open source and enterprise. But in this case, uh, it'll be uh, at either the bucket level for open source or database level, allowing you to identify that your cloud account as a target and within the product configure it such that uh, the data will be sent as it arrives to those buckets or database locations and replicate that up to cloud. And durable meaning if the connection to cloud is lost from a network uh, connection issue or other, um, that uh, data will be stored locally until that connection is re restored and then the, the stored data will be on played to cloud. That's the difference. The um, previous subscription mechanism was not durable. Um, so if the connection was down for any reason, you would miss, there would be a gap in the data, obviously that got replicated. And so the idea is to take advantage of some uh, capabilities that we've already built into enterprise, package them up and offer them into the open source capabilities around the eventual consistency and use the cloud as a potential target. Um, and so look for that in InfluxDB open source 2.2, uh, which should be out here in December. And uh, again, the 1.10 release of InfluxDB Enterprise early part of Q1. And so Chris, I know I ran a little bit over, but uh, in summary, uh, looking to meet developers where they are, whether you're in a browser, IDE, we wanna support those languages that you uh, know and love. And we've got at least 10 of those as client libraries uh, that already exist. You can generate your code from the browser and, and, and take it off to the IDE and start working with it. We're offering both the software and the cloud options available for you across a wide variety of locations and direct or through the cloud marketplaces. And we'll continue to optimize the time to awesome in the platform, uh, helping you collaborate, building those capabilities into the platform, easing the uh, observability and operations and making it as easy as possible to get data in. That is it. All right, so there are some questions. Um, Chris will tell me that I have a few minutes for, for questions. Thank you. Uh, message with Chronograph is not clear. Are we planning to make that primary de facto tool with all enhancements, panels, or keep promoting Grafana? Use what you want. Uh, my, my message to you is I don't, I don't have an ax to grind here. We like Chronograph from the perspective that it is a standalone, deployable, separately securable dashboarding tool, and it is optimized to work with InfluxDB only. Grafana, great partners of ours, they build a, a generic dashboarding tool that works really well with InfluxDB, but it also works well with a wide variety of other sources. Continue using it. Um, we just uh, made enhancements to Chronograph to allow it to easily connect uh, using the V2 authentication protocols to um, either cloud or open source. Um, so if you want to use tokens uh, and uh, define the organization that, that Chronograph connects to, you can certainly do that. We also made enhancements to Chronograph to allow it to expose the uh, Flux-based tasks that you configure and deploy into 
uh, capacitor. It's a read-only view, but at least you'll be able to see that. If you're interested in continuing to use Chronograph as sort of an authoring tool for that, we'd love to hear that feedback, and that's an enhancement that we certainly can make. Um, I love this question. We need our data stored in our AWS v VPC. Is that possible? Uh, so first of all, security is a slippery, slippery slope. Um, our cloud offering is a multi-tenant offering. So VPC is a little bit strange because you could set up a VPC connection between you and us, um, but that doesn't prevent people from coming in the front door meaning they could come in through the browser directly. It's a multi-tenant service, wherever they want to access from an airport kiosk, their phone or, or whatnot. And so um, the question here comes, uh, comes about, about you know, what you're really trying to achieve and how we can do that. Um, we have discussed options for uh, access deny so that, for example, when you set up an organization, uh, you have to be coming from uh, an IP address range, which is uh, specified by you. And only if you're coming from that range, do we allow you in that would prevent you from uh, coming in through, you know, airport kiosk, et cetera, without setting up a VPN connection. Um, so if it's about data uh, provenance and, and sort of data control, um, yeah, then, then uh, InfluxDB Enterprise might be your option. Um, if you have to control it, if you're, uh, yeah, so definitely uh, we, we would need to dig into that uh, more deeply with you um, just to make sure we understand the requirements and then how best to satisfy that. All right, <clears throat> many new features are cloud only or cloud first. Where does that leave enterprise customers? Good question. Uh, where it leaves you is we continue to advance um, enterprise and we offer the latest and greatest editions of Flux, for example. Um, but we're going to start landing features in cloud first. And why are we doing that? Because cloud provides us with the easiest and best proving ground for almost every feature. Um, and then what we've been doing is um, once those have been hardened, tested, tested, validated at scale, then we've been packaging up most of that and offering it to our enterprise customers. Flux is the biggest advancement that we've made in the platform in the last few years. And so, um, you know, I want to start uh, I want to start by making sure it works and then put it in, in your hands. As a matter of fact, we've, we've done that um, for the enterprise releases themselves. Uh, we had a single tenant uh, version of cloud that we were running for some time, and we were testing and validating all enterprise releases before they left our shop through that mechanism. So using cloud as the means to uh, build, test, and validate at scale before offering that to enterprise customers is, is our approach. But you'll continue to see advancements for our enterprise customers across the board uh, for basically everything that we do. Um, but it'll go in cloud first. Um, what about a more advanced geo mapping plotting panel? So for those of you that have been using um, the browser to build uh, dashboards within uh, InfluxDB cloud, there is a, a map uh, visualization. And so Yash hit me up on uh, Slack or in the community Slack channel, we've got a, I think we've got a specific Slack channel dedicated to, to mapping where we can uh, dig into what more you'd like. Um, but right now what it allows you to do is it will allow you to map data uh, in a geotemporal way. You, there's a flux package that allows for uh, geotemporal uh, expressions. Um, you can uh, do everything from tracking to, um, geofencing uh, and then overlay that with time um, and today you can also visualize based on uh, visualize map markers based on uh, values and change their colors if there's more things you want to be able to do let's talk be happy to get that input what's my best approach to migrating my tick scripts to flux are there any docs yeah absolutely as i mentioned in the talk there is the flux um, tick script package the helper package and a full documentation around that to uh, to do that so check it out, let us know. Uh, let's see, just to confirm, schema lockdown can only be allowed for additions and not removal. Yeah, so if you if you create a schema uh, and then you, you, know, you wanna remove a bunch of columns from it, um, that is not possible today. Uh, you would create a new schema without those columns and have to redirect uh, direct the data. So you can add columns to it, but the removal is not currently possible. You are welcome for the Flux uh, query node for tick scripts. Uh, so you must be deep into tick script. You are welcome. Um, take advantage of that. 
um, and exporting your query is cool. I'm glad you like it. Uh, definitely try that out. Um, definitely select those. Um, I think there's some other ergonomic things that we could do there, separating them into two separate files and a package that you could download. I know some people like to work with um, the Flux queries as sort of a separate, uh, you know, a separate um, file, uh, and then re referencing that file within their code. So we may look to improve some ergonomics there as well. All right, Chris, I think that is that is enough.